All right. So I want to talk about why you should think like an editor, but I also think it's a fair question to say, why should you think like an editor? It feels a little bit like if you're asking someone to think like an editor, it's like asking someone to think like a dinosaur, because there were very few people who used to publish. It was a very restricted class of professionals who did things in a very certain way. And generally speaking, it's great that it's been democratized and you have more voices, more diversity, more access. But the trouble I have as someone who is trained sort of classically as a journalist is that there's really not enough yelling. And by that I mean there's not enough yelling. No one is saying, who cares, right? And that is one of those things that they really um, hammer into you. And I'd say like, okay, the yelling part is a little, is a little iffy, but um, I went to journalism school. I worked as a journalist in the United States and in Italy, in English and Italian. I've worked with editors probably a good dozen nationalities. They're different ages, they're different genders, they're completely different backgrounds, but their mentality is pretty much all the same. And there are really two basic components to it. Um, uh, this is J. Jonah Jameson, who is also my favorite Spider-Man character, uh, has been since childhood, which I think says a lot about me. Uh, but they're a lot like this. Um, they ask very direct questions and they're very skeptical. So I like to think of it as kind of like the J. Jonah Jameson OS, Triple J OS, if you want to shorten it, because they all basically think the same way. They're asking you the same questions, they want to know the same stuff, and they're not messing around. So while as an editorial director now, I don't advocate for yelling, I, I promise, I don't even like all caps type people which I will say we think is yelling, but it's not yelling. Like, it's not throwing a stapler. It's not overturning a desk, which are things that I have actually seen. So let's, let's I, I do have a few sharp angles on these things, but it is nothing like what it used to be, which, which is all good. But I think what we're missing is that grounding in upfront questions and skepticism. So why does this matter here? Why am I talking about this here? Well, I have worked in open source for a long time, and I'm also a volunteer, um, and I think there's this illusion of sort of the butterfly effect, like you have a cool project and you, you know, do a little thing, and you think that somewhere th there's gonna be like this tsunami of interest that you're gonna make this impact, but you haven't actually told anybody about it, and your communications are either terrible or sparse or both, and it, it really doesn't matter. Um, you cannot almost, you, you almost cannot over communicate. If, if you're doing it wrong, it means you're either talking not to the right people or you're not talking about it in the right way. You're not, you're not hitting the interest. Um, so I also think that the open source community has a huge advantage compared to other sectors, which is that we do have a bent and an interest in sharing useful information, which is great but it's not enough. So there are two key components to this triple J OS, and they are a lot of skepticism and very blunt questions, and they start you on this early. So my journalism advisor had this tacky little statue that he got at a garage sale. On, it sat on the front of his desk, and for four years I sat looking at this thing uh, while he redlined my copy with a big skeptical eyebrow, he had taped this over it, and it says, if your mother says she loves you, <laughs> check it out. So this is how deep you have to go. This is, you know, journalism school was a place where the professors would regularly say to people, when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. And you would just sit there and be like, oh, okay. So some of the best stories I ever wrote as a freelancer in Italy were about questioning certain assumptions. And one of them that just came up in the news again was about these baby boxes that they're now having in the US where you can drop off a baby. And uh, they first were reborn in Italy. Um, this is over 10 years ago. But people think Italians love family and they think that they have big families and neither of those things are true. And you know that if you've been in the country for more than five minutes. Um, the other thing that people tend not to know or remember is that Italy has a centuries old tradition of this. So in Florence, there's still a foundling wheel. You can see it, it's called the Hospital of the Innocents. And the other interesting thing about it is all the babies who were left there took that name, 
So it's innocent, innocenti, innocentini, some version of that, right? So you could look at the phone book, if anyone actually had a phone book to look at, you can still find people who bear those names, right? So the idea was they were reviving this for a whole host of reasons, but it just wasn't the kind of thing that you would think when you think of Italy, you think of you know, terrible ragu commercials or whatever. You don't think of this, and that was really the crux of the story, questioning sort of the base assumptions that people have about Italy for an American audience. So, all right, get to the questions, okay? These are the five W's, and you do not go to your editor, like JJJ does not want to hear it if you cannot answer these. And they are who, what, when, where, and why, okay? The interesting thing to me was that I learned these as they called it the five W's, but actually they tacked on how. So obviously we're writers because the math does not check out. I'm including it here because when you talk about tech, it's incredibly important. The how is a lot of times everything. Did, did anybody follow the Theranos scandal? Do you, do you remember how that story broke? Um, I remember a little bit of it, but I have I do have it in my back pocket, yes. <laughs> but yeah, so, so, so. Exactly. Exactly. So what happened with the Theranos scandal is they, you, you've, got some, you've got a Stanford dropout with a Steve Jobs turtleneck, huge amount of, of venture funding, and everybody thinks this thing is great, right? It takes an old school journalist from the Wall Street Journal, right, to go, wait a minute, how does this thing actually work? How do you get a machine that can fit in a pharmacy that can take a drop of blood and accurately, accurately diagnose everything? He, that just doesn't pass the, if your mother says she loves you, check it out, bar at all. And he wasn't an expert, but what we're good at is asking questions and trying to figure stuff out. So he was like, if you, you know, they gave him the gobbledygook, their patent, they're like, blah, 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 it's more protected by IP. And he was like, yeah, you know, that just doesn't make any sense. I can't take that to anybody and ask somebody who really knows this stuff whether this thing would actually work. And so then he put on his gumshoe and started talking to people behind the scenes, and that's how it came out. So. Anytime you're talking about tech, I think how has got to be part of it. So just don't worry too much about the math, I guess is what I'm saying. So let's say you, you've passed the 5W question. Your editor's like, okay, do something with this. You've answered the basics. Now you have another consideration, and that's the difference between news and a story, right? So news is anything that happens, and they can be things that are big and things that are small, like someone's cat dies, someone loses their phone, someone wins the lottery. But the story is what you make of it, right? So if you're so bereft that your cat, Dubert, dies, that you start this day that's still happening, that's a story. We've all lost our phones, but how many of us have had them returned by a scuba diver? And the interesting part about this is it was in a waterproof case, so it actually worked. I know, I love this. Uh, and I'm not really a huge fan of like the secret and whatever, but this guy won a significant amount of money because he was house hunting and the address on one of the houses matched his friends and he played the numbers. So interesting story there. And what used to happen in the kind of newsroom that, that J. Jonah Jameson ran was there was the, the wire, the news wire, right? And that thing, it was a machine that sat there in the newsroom and also the editor's room, and it cranked out stories all day long. It made this terrible grating noise, and it was really, really distracting. But the whole point of it was you would be trying to work on something so that your editor would not stomp across the newsroom with a sheet of paper ripped off and say, hey, kid, storify this. Because that's when you get the thing about somebody winning the lottery or someone's cat died and there's just the bare bones and you have to try to figure out how to turn it into something. And usually you do that by talking to people. Um, listening also, listening to people also works. The bare bones of that is just kind of paying attention, right? And so that sort of leads into um, what, we're, what I'm thinking about this week, right? So I, I think one of the better things about journalism is it's a, it's a really practical profession. So I'd like to talk about if, if someone at home, at work, is expecting to come out of, with something from this event, how you might try to go about it, right? Um, and we've all been here all week, right? There were 13 micro-conferences 
Uh, what sessions stood out? What keynotes were there? Um, how do you figure out what to turn around quickly? So skeptic or, a skeptical editor also does not want to see your post about this a month from now. So trying to figure out what you're going to say about what, what happened this week soon is actually pretty critical. So there really are like n different ways that you can do this. Um, and to me, the gold standard is there's actually a story like, like capital N news that comes out of something and you lead with that. This is not a middle school book report, right? Or a field trip thing. Um, skeptical editor does not want to see something that starts with like, I went to Dublin and blah, blah, blah. So in this example, <laughs> This is from DEF CON of last year, and if you check out the URL, I don't think the reporter was actually there. Um, I have the suspicion that the YouTube video is like five days older than this, that maybe some intern, like this is, this is the reading the wire of today, was you know, checking out these things, and this came out of it. Now, this got, they actually did make the phone calls and follow up with people and do the emails and stuff, so it, it, they fleshed out the story. But the event itself, there's nothing about it. It doesn't say, I went to DEF CON and it happened five days ago and it was in this town and blah, blah, blah. Like this is, you've taken this out of it and you could do something with it. Um, the other thing I would think if you're on a small team, you should get at least three posts from an event like this, like minimum, because you should tell people you're coming, what you're, what, why are you here, right? Again, we're getting back to like, what's the point? Like, you came here, someone sent you here, you had to get travel approval, why? Like, what are you looking forward to? What are you gonna participate in? Are you speaking? Do you have a booth? Are you on a, you know, special interest group? Like, what, why, okay? So you should tell people that so they know to look for you. Then there should be a couple of posts that come out of something, this is, this is obviously the big thing, um, but if you sat through keynotes and you don't have a post, you were not paying attention. There, I'm not saying, this is the, the thing when you're talking about the what of this is that you don't have to cover the whole thing, right? No one went to the 13 micro conferences, no one cares about that. They sent you here for a reason, focus on that, okay? So again, I think the what of this can also be a little bit way more focused actually. And the keynotes, like honestly, you, you have to come up with something. So. Is this anyone's first OSS? Oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. I wasn't expecting so many newcomers. Okay, so when you saw this on the schedule, you were like, what, what is this, right? And if it's not your first OSS, you know that there's gonna be something there, right? You probably, even if it's your first OSS, you have an inkling, right, because of who's involved, that there's gonna be something coming out of it. But if you've been to more than one of these, the whole point is you know something, you just don't know what, because they haven't told you. So this is like one of these things that you have to kind of know to look for. But uh, th there was a 25 minute conversation between these two. I think I tweeted at least three or four things. You could easily, like who's here for security? Anybody like working on the kernel? Anybody doing, what brings you here? Okay. And promoting my project. Okay, cool. Okay, anybody else? Um, looking if my company can go fully open source. Oh, yeah. interesting. So you were on all the OSPO stuff, right? Yeah, super stuff. Very interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I think, I think a lot of us always feel like we're sort of newbies, but so that's cool. Anybody else? <laughs> Oh, awesome, okay. So from those examples, there's nothing from this keynote that I would particularly pull out, but it was, again, as a 25 minute session, he talked about boring software, and this stood out to me because I, I think it was three or four years ago, Kelsey Hightower, who if any, any of you ever get the chance to hear him, like he is the master of keynotes, he gave a whole thing at a container conference that was about how it's great because the technology is now boring. And because he's so good, it's stuck in my head. So to hear this, I was like, here it is again. I could probably find the Kelsey quote. I could probably see if anybody else has it just been me that I haven't been going to these conferences and people are talking about it because virtual conferences are terrible, or is this actually a thing? But you could use something like this to, to peg a whole story. Like again, you don't have to cover um, everything. But if you want to, 
Um, this was something that we typically did at the Open Staff Foundation. And this was our event. It lasted five days. We had thousands of people. And we would do these massive, massive recaps. And this is a group effort. So if you're here with other people on your team, you get a collaborative doc. Uh, and you figure out what the points you're going to highlight. But what I would like you to notice is that it's focused on the, on the reader. It, it's not saying, we did this, we were there, blah, blah, blah. No. It's, a, it's, it's what you need to know, right? Um, the other interesting thing is we kept the intro super short, but there's still a detail about the Melbourne Cup, which is Australia's premier horse race. So it's like Ascot or Kentucky Derby, depending on your geographical reference. So there was a moment, and there was photos in this that were fantastic because you had this like highfalutin horse crowd with people with hoodies, and we're all in the same place. It's hilarious, right? The whole point also about the when of these stories is this is never going to happen again. This is it. Like, you're never going to be at a place where there's, uh, you know, this horse race and 5,000 tech people for Open Stack Foundation. This is it. So you got to get it, right? Um, the other thing I want you to notice is that uh, there are four sections to this that we devised thinking about what kind of readers. There's not one reader. There are four different kinds of readers. And actually, the, the most annoying thing about this whole project is uh, the formatting and the editing of this is a nightmare because people throw in different bits and bobs and everybody has a different style. And it's up to the editor to make sure that it's all coherent. The anchor links, I, I always hated them. They're terrible. But the point is, no one's expecting you to slog through the whole thing, right? So let's say you've answered the five W's, you figured out what you're going to talk about. The next thing um, the editor is going to say in terms of the next, so what? Because there's this endless series of like, yeah, and, 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 and. They're going to ask you for the details, like what makes this fun? What, what made this, you know, was it the Melbourne Cup? What was it, right? And that is color. They're always going to ask you to add some color. So this week, uh, let's see, what have I got? A Guinness glass. I'm hopefully not taking COVID home with me. You know, you might have like a Dublin Castle keychain. There's always something, you know. There was one conference where we got snowed in and there was like the hashtag snowpocalypse. There. Like, there's always something, right? And so you, once you've sort of figured out who your reader is and why they should be there, um, you really do want to give them a sense of like why you came. Because that, that's, again, it, it, it not only promotes your work, but it just gives people a reason of why you're there. Um, one thing that I skipped over and I'm going to go back to is the who of the five W's. And that can cover who you're talking to or who the subject of the story is. But it's also who, who's your reader? Like, are you writing this for your, for your company, for your clients, uh, for your friends, your frenemies, your future employer? Like, what, what do you, who, who is this for, right? And if you keep that in mind, it tends to get a lot more focused. I was really struggling to find some good examples of posts that people had written on their own personal blogs after these events. And again, I see it over and over. It's like, you know, this is my summer vacation essay. No, no one wants to see that. No one wants to read that. It's not interesting, right? Um, and I think there's just a lot of stuff that ends up getting sort of left on the floor because people don't focus it, right? So. Again, the quickest way to get one of those um, five takeaways posts is to think about literally what you're taking away, right? And again, let's hope it's not something bad. Um, but uh, did this, did you, you can mental and technical. So like, did it feel like business as usual? Um, was this the last blowout before everybody sort of hunkers down for the winter and we try again? Um, and then the technical things, like what, what technical challenges were people talking about? Uh, you know, who, who people were excited about what. Um, and so I am in favor of shortcuts, and any editor will tell you to take shortcuts, like smart shortcuts. And Twitter is great for this. So if you're a Twitter person, like the easiest way to do this is just to check your timeline. Like it's easy just to review it and be like, what did I tweet? What did I retweet? What do I want to go back and look at? And if you're not a Twitter person, meaning you don't tweet, you have no excuse. Um, you need to use something like TweetDeck and set up the hashtag for the summit and set up hashtags for or topics that you're interested in in the columns and just let it rip. 
because it, it serves as sort of a reminder of all the things you've seen. And it's like the best news wire ever. You know, like Reuters doesn't have a patch on Twitter for this kind of stuff. You can really go granular and get a lot of great content. The other thing is, again, it's not, it's about you and your perspective, but it's not all about you because you can easily embed stuff from other people and it's kind of like you're quoting them. You get the great bits from other people and you can say what you thought about them. That's a really valid way to, you know, slap together something quickly that's also, also uh, focused. So an example of this, you know, an editor will also always tell you, show, don't tell. Now, we're not pretending that this is like a bit of scientific research here, folks. So, like I said, you, you can be personal. Uh, you're not on trial. This isn't a wire service. Um, but one thing that I noticed, because I have not been in person in an event since February 2020, uh, which was the Geneva UN Partnerships, Humanitarian Partnerships Program, so completely different vibe. And there were no masks. There was like these big hand sanitizer stations. We were sort of spaced out to get into the event. But uh, Europeans, lots of cheek kissing, lots of handshaking. You weren't supposed to do it, but people just weren't in that mindset. We still really had no idea what it was going to mean. So here we are, are, are now, masked, doing it. It's, it. And I have not seen this kind of thing at a, a lot of conferences where the idea is that you dictate how much physical contact and what kind you want, which honestly, we should have done this 20 years ago. I would uh, hugely welcome this. I had a lot of, again, my Texas colleagues were big huggers, not my thing. And if you kind of put up a badge without having to have some like long, embarrassing conversation about it, much better. Yesterday, I walked by and I noticed, again, not scientific, but I'm showing you, not telling you, that uh, there were a lot of greens gone. The, the yellows were also mostly gone, but there were way more reds, and there weren't even any green buttons left, folks. And that tells me, again, I'm not, you know, that, that, that people were more in the mood for more contact, and they were feeling relaxed and okay about it. I, I, you know, people abided by the mass rules. People were cool about it. But this is not something that you saw previously, right? So this is, um, again, another detail that you could use about this to, to tell part of the story, at least, in a way that, you know, adds some detail. So uh, I think, unless someone wanted to, I, I, so I, I do believe in editing, I do believe in writing, I do believe in content. I also um, love digital because we all make mistakes. So I don't know if anyone actually managed to spot the typo in my bio, because I have a special prize for you before we get to the questions, if you want. Nobody? Uh, it's pretty bad, because I, I do like deadlines, and I work well to deadlines, but calls for papers are just the worst. Um, there's nothing worse than having to like write about yourself in the third person, having to pitch yourself like this. I hate it. I'd rather be you know, doing my thing somewhere. So uh, yeah, there's a huge typo. And um, there's also open source with a hyphen, which I'm profoundly conflicted about. But we can, we can talk about that. But yeah, I spotted that a couple of days ago. And I just thought, like, ugh. And it didn't seem like enough to uh, try to make them go back and fix. So but I did have a special prize if someone, if someone wanted to um, point it out. Uh, what questions do you have for me? What challenges are you facing with marketing? Uh, well, I, uh, my, my challenge is the following. I always think that uh, if I work hard enough or if my team works hard enough, we can have a good content. But I lack of this publish, publish channel. So once mm. I have this good content, I don't have a channel to spread it out. OK, so the comment is, I believe in content. I want to create good content. but you're unclear about the channels and how to get it out, right? Sometimes I'm very jealous about those uh, Twitter influencers <laughs> where they just say, oh, I eat a burger, and then you get a lot of likes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every time I say, oh, come on, I do very hard-coded work, you know. I write this Python thing in very low-detail things, low-level things, but how come I cannot get any attention? 
I yeah, I think I think there's there's definitely so the the comment is again how how do you get to be an influencer like why is no one caring about my content which is huge but i do think there is value in being consistent in having an editorial calendar in figuring out where you are in the world what time to post things like it is amazing to me that i'm based in san francisco we think we're the center of the world but we're actually at the end of it and people will post things at three o'clock in the afternoon like like in Asia, they're in the future already. It's already tomorrow. Like, what are you thinking? So I, I do believe there's a value in setting up a structure for things and then and being consistent, being consistent. Um, you're, you know, like the, I wouldn't sweat the traffic so much as I would really try to have good content. So who are the people who might be interested in your project? Like, what are you, are you trying to get financing or adopters or what? Okay. Sometimes I, I always ask me the question if I, you know, I, I have, we are a venture back, so we have money. But let's say I'm using $10 million uh, to set up, uh, to build up good content versus to build up good publishing channels. I would rather spend all the money on building up the publishing channels. Oh, that's a really interesting point. Uh, because if you actually have the channels working but your content is terrible, it doesn't matter. And I, I really do think on, th there's so much stuff like, you know, Twitter advertising, a lot of stuff just doesn't work. So my suggestion about that would be to figure out where your people go to read stuff. So um, that, that story from DEF CON, like that was Hacker News stuff. So if you can get something that goes on Hacker News, like you're good. What it, are your people reading Hacker Noon, Hacker News? Like you're better off spending time trying to get the people where they are then establish the channels. Like, I mean, the channels to me are like, do you have a blog, like a WordPress or something like that? Yes, but I, I like, uh, I feel like, you know, I, I hope there is kind of like a multiple Twitter influencers that, you know, I can build up connections so I can spread out the news even faster to grow the audience. So that's kind of the publisher channel that I was talking about. I'm sorry, I lost you. Uh, say that again. Yeah, so, so basically, every company has its own blog post, Twitter, LinkedIn, Correct. Uh, this kind of social account. So that's very essential. Like, uh, I think every Correct. company has. I, I'm talking about spending extra money on building the, like, say, for, for example, a network of Twitter influencers so that you can spread the news faster and bolder to grow the audience. Right. So, does anybody think that devs are really, open source devs are really on Twitter? You do, or yeah, I, I'm kind of, I'm skeptical. <laughs> I know, go figure. Why don't you do that on LinkedIn, for example? Like, Pardon? LinkedIn even works in, for getting traction. So I guess the more clear, the more you know, you can build it, it, See, so we're getting back to the who, what, and when are this. It depends on the community. So, so what I see at Intel is no one's on Twitter. Like our guys don't use Twitter. They don't care about it. Um, People do like LinkedIn uh, because, again, I think LinkedIn is, in, in my mind, it, it depends on the project and what you're trying to do, but I think it's undervalued. The value in LinkedIn is you get a lot of people who sort of, it, that's where you show off and make yourself look good to your coworkers or your future employer. And people put up some great content on there for that reason. And I remember at the OpenStack Foundation, we got actually quite a bit of traction because if your company's investing, you know, OpenStack was not like this thing that you took out of the box. So if they're investing in it and it's a huge project and they've got people on it, it your update as the head of this project or the head of engineering or whatever is valuable because you're telling the company what you're actually doing. And they're going, okay, we're spending all this money on this OpenStack, thank God, but you know, hey, look at, look at our data center, look at what we're doing. Like this thing is, look at the number of cores we got. Like this, thing's, is, this thing is actually on, like it's actually working. And LinkedIn works great for that. For adoption, I, I think your channels, but I mean, I'm interested to hear what other people have to say. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of from a while back, we go with the thing. So for the, the stuff that I work on, web technology, for developers, Twitter is a big channel. OK. And so um, Google putting on events, and so all of our engineering team went, yeah, we need to be presenting at the event. How do yeah. we get to present? How do we get travel approval? Blah, yeah. Blah, blah. 
But then when we were kind of talking to VPs and the people who are actually signing the checks, they were like, all this is chit chat on Twitter, we're not interested. Until some, some VP at Google wrote something on LinkedIn <laughs> that we could point to. Right, so it's kind of both. Yeah. Right? So, uh, that's, from my perspective, not one or the other. It's just like you were saying. So, so the, the, the comment is sort of this top-down, bottom-up thing about the different channels and how they work. Because again, all of your people who actually are involved in this project could be on Twitter, but the people who approve you to go to a conference where you speak and you're showing it off and you're driving adoption are like, nah, what is this thing? It's a bunch of guys in the corner on Twitter, right? Like, we're VPs, you know, we're not on it and we don't care. So again, it wasn't until somebody saw it on LinkedIn that they said, oh yeah, let's, let's send these folks. So I, I definitely think there's value in that. I mean, to drive adoption, developer adoption for an open source project, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank yeah. you, subreddit, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, like, like so much of, of open source, it's meeting people where they are, um, and so figure out where they hang out and hang out there. So the, the comment is about how you actually find these people, and um, I, uh, the, it, the comment was super spot on because the idea is we all want to be in Wired, and that's great, but before you get into Wired, mm -hmm you've got to get enough people interested and involved in your project. And the way you do that is through, again, old school things like mailing lists. Like you, it's, it's probably, you probably, there are probably some that you're already on already, right? That you don't even think like, hey, we could get featured in this. That matters infinitely more than spending what we were saying, like $10 million or some crazy thing to get featured by, you know, who's the influence, like, I don't know. Again, like if Kelsey Hightower is like, yeah, this is great, like, okay, you're good, but that's unlikely. We don't have, you know, he's he's not that kind of influencer, right? And I think in open source, there just we don't have people who shill that have any credibility. It's not the Kardashian thing where you're going to move lipstick or underwear or something. Like you're trying to get people to get involved in this project. And so that comment is absolutely spot on because you're getting adoption from the places where people hang out. And again. I do think it's worth spending time on Reddit. I do think it's worth spending time on um, Stack Overflow. So if if there, you have any adopters, is, is, is anybody answering questions? Like that, that's, that's content too. Yeah. To, to, to go back just a little bit, um, as, as a developer, as someone who's, who's building a product, also spending your time on Reddit and spending your time on Twitter and spending your time and like finding out where your users are, that's not my core competence. Writing is not my core competency. So, from, from the perspective of, of, of an editor, what are some of the successful patterns you've seen for building partnerships between people who have things they need to say but don't have writing as their core competency but can work with a writer who's good at it? So, the question is if you've got technical folks who don't produce content and you're an editorial person who needs to produce that comment, how do you do that? I feel in a lot of places, people just don't know that they're writers and also people willing to listen to them. I think I have actually, I got a, a couple of really great stories from people, you know, mailing list threads, gosh, IRC when that was actually still hopping. I would see stuff, people would say stuff and I'd be like, well, what? You did what? And if you go and say like, tell me about this thing, people will. I also feel like there has to be, and this, much of this depends on the company, like how much legal, how much infrastructure you need, like the legal approval and all this stuff. You need to be able to sort of usher people through that process, but nine times out of 10, they need to know there's someone there and someone who's gonna listen to them and that actually people are interested. Because I feel like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've come across somebody doing something really cool and they're just kind of keeping it to themselves because they don't get that it's a it's a story like this could again and it's the open source thing it, this could actually be useful for someone and you go wait a minute you did you made what you did what 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 and they're like oh yeah no 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 
the thing I said most often at the OpenStack Foundation was that's a post. I would go, we would sit on these team meetings and, and, and largest team, and I, I at my co invariably, like that's a thing, we need to do that. And they go, really? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, not only do we need to do that, but we're doing it. Um, and I, you, you get pretty good results, but I think that it's, it's it, a lot of it depends on the company. If you've got the structure, do people know? Do, do you have competent technical editors? Because I think that it, it's, I am fascinated by learning to write professionally in a second language and publishing in a second language. But, you know, the road is long, my friends. It is hard. So I've worked with writers from all over the world. Um, probably the heaviest lift was this thing called the Denim Bible. It's like 800 pages long, and it's all about genes. So never again. But uh, I work with, you know, you work with people who are using English as a second language from all over the world. You've also got to bake that in. I think there's a lot of people. It's great that we have a global community, but you really have to also tell people that they're, you're going to make them look good, right? That you're not going to, you know, and you've got technical, your technical editors also have to be up to speed because I will tell you that as an editor who's not, who's technical enough, there have been times when I'm like, is that preposition right? Because I don't know exactly, should it be of this thing or by this thing or for this thing? And you, you need really good editors, technical editors, probably with a technical background to be able to distinguish that. So I think there's also that, like nobody wants to take something that they've made in the world and look foolish, right? So you've got to assure people that you, your, your main job is to make them look good. You're going to share this cool thing they did. People are going to be really interested in it, but they're not going to look like idiots. And I, I, think, I think there's a lot of fear around that in the technical community, really, more than you would think. Yeah. So if we're, we're a really small project built in a larger um, company, um, but we don't have editors, we don't have professional writers, we're a bunch of technical people like trying to promote our stuff. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of content here that you yeah, for sure. And, and, and ideas, but where, where would I get the most bang for the buck, and where should <sighs> I focus on to get started? My right, right. Engineers producing is it, is it more like focusing on one good piece of content and getting it out into many channels? No, I, 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 I'm sure there there are folks in this room who who have different opinions, but I I believe in consistency. If you do something, you need to publish something about it. Um, but I also wanted to leave you, um, I hope you guys will write some cool stuff about this event. And uh, you can get in touch with me. Um, the buddy edit is your friend. So you don't have professional editors, but another set of eyes of people in your company. What you really need to do in that situation is like assign somebody a buddy and take turns editing stuff. Because nine times out of 10, something cheap and cheerful or free, even like Grammarly, especially if you're not writing in English as a first language, that and another pair of eyes from your own company will fix it. Like, it'll be good enough. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. This is not, you know, the New York Times. You just have to get your point across and be succinct about it. So that would be my recommendation. I don't know if anybody else has some thoughts on that. The Hemingway yeah. app. Oh, the Hemingway app, if you like that. I'm not such a huge fan, but Hemingway, Grammarly. Yeah, yeah Hemingway, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not, but so there are, the, the point of this, Hemingway is another one, but Grammarly is good, a solid, simple. I would recommend you try some of these apps, especially if you're writing in English as a second language, and a buddy, a bu another person from your company who knows the material to edit. And consistency. Consistency, so. Getting something out like regularly. Yeah, and, and don't publish at weird times, and don't publish on a Monday, and don't publish on a Friday, and like all that sort of common sense stuff, yeah. Yes, I just have a last question because I see there's a one minute left. Yes. Ooh. So We're on deadline, you, folks. Yeah. Right, yeah. So I have a question about this uh, OKR. So let's say you mentioned oh, that you, you, want, you have many great articles. So what does great mean? Like, how do you numerically quantify this great? Like, in your department, in your team, you must have some OKR or KPI to track the greatness. Do you use Google Ads? OK, so, okay so I will tell you. I oh, So the question is, how do you track this stuff? How do you know what you're doing works, right? Mm -hmm. And do you use OKRs or KPIs? And I'm here to tell you that I hate all of that. Uh, I, do, I, think, I think being too analytics driven really misses the point. You, you, you will be able to tell 
with the driver adoption, with getting your talks accepted, with people showing up, which is not something, frankly, I was expecting today, but thanks, everyone. Um, that's how you will know. I think a lot of this stuff, if you're too data-driven on this, you're missing the point. Um, and in, part of it is, in the beginning, you have to feel your way into understanding what content people want from you. I, I, I've been at Intel since May, and I run the Twitter account, and I'm just like trying stuff out. I have no idea. And until they tell me to do it differently, I'm going to keep trying stuff. Yeah. Last question. Uh, yeah. So I do com for my company, and um, I saw you the, nodding. <laughs> you were like, no, "Yeah, I'm testify." Yeah, yeah. So some of the senior VPs, your first question of why do I care? Yeah. Um, it's a it's a constant wolf that you run into, right? Yeah, for sure. No, no, this is really important, and we need to add sixteen new adjectives and story ads because somebody's going to read this, <clears throat> which you know, as a writer, they're never they're never going to. So the question is, you have VPs, and they want to say everything's the greatest, and a lot of people, it seems like sometimes the higher you go, like the, the, the crunkier the writing is. Um, and that's not all the time, but it happens a lot of the time. So I think what I do, if I think it's going to be contentious, is this is a really simple solution. I also do this when I'm editing people who are English as a second language. I'll put the content in a column. So I will completely rewrite the whole thing, hit it with the simple stick, what you're, you're not, I will because they see, because they see, and if they give you, they they, they see the the difference. Um, they see the difference in the way it looks, and if they still hate it, I have pushed back to try to like let me try this because they honestly they don't know, and I should know. That's why I'm there. That's why you hired me. So if you let me try this and see what happens. Um, then they see, because it's, it's hard to be simple and talk about tech, but the simpler you are, the more direct you are. I also think for an open source, we're a relatively new team now back at Intel, and we're defining this, and I'm pushing to be simple and direct and minus the gobbledygook and all the marketing speak, because it does not work in any of these communities. People hate it. It's immediately off-putting. And you know we're a legacy company. People are expecting us to be like all gobbledygook and boring. And so the whole thing is to try to to be straightforward and simple. Um, so I think it's it's part you have to get the mandate, and you part have to show them what it actually looks like, and then make sure that they're reading stuff that's good. Show them your if you like find competitors of stuff that you like, and be like, look, they're doing it like this. Like find somebody good, and uh, that would be that would be where I would stop with that. So thank you, everybody.